If you've ever heard of the OLPC laptop program, that's one laptop per child, or the X01, you'll know what this is. This is an original X01 that was part of the OLPC program. Uh, when it launched, they came up with a clever marketing campaign. It was the Give One, Get One program, or G1, G1. And the object was to get people who are philanthropic to purchase two laptops, keep one, and send the other one to a developing nation that was participating in the OLPC program where they were deploying these devices. And in doing that, they successfully sold, I believe, 78,500 devices, half of which were in the hands of public um, or private individuals. Some of those individuals would have donated both laptops, and they just wanted to be, you know, nice. <laughs> and to them, I say thank you. But this one right here is one of the original OLPC uh, Give One, Get One laptops that was gotten. <laughs> they gave one, and they got one. And they apparently sold it to a pawn shop in Canada, and that's where the person I bought it from got it. It is in like new condition. It is the cleanest used laptop I have ever laid my grubby hands on. So this device was obviously not well used, if at all, which is kind of what I was going for. I've been wanting one of these laptops ever since the program started. I thought it was the coolest thing I've ever seen. Because the laptop was designed to be nothing more than a tool. A tool to educate children in developing nations. And in doing so, they designed a laptop that was low cost. It was touted as the $100 laptop, although it didn't really come anywhere near that in actuality. I think it was more of a $200 laptop, once you figure in deployment and shipping costs. But they managed to develop a laptop that is perfect for field service and for um, backpackers and people who need a laptop to just get work done. Uh, that is um, creating video blogs, um, very light social media, of course social media of back then, not today, um, writing papers and essays and journals and um, it's just an all-around terrific laptop. It's durable as all hell um, it was designed to withstand adverse weather conditions. They designed this laptop for classrooms like the ones in Africa, where they're basically outdoor classrooms, and they're sitting in circles, and they've got an instructor in the middle, or um, they've got dust storms and, and, and rain and, and just unpredictable weather that can definitely ruin a modern laptop to scrap metal or reduce a modern laptop to scrap metal in, in, in just seconds. Um, this is basically like the... Uh, it, it's almost like they were inspired by the original Apple iBook, which, unlike modern renditions of the MacBook, um, is in fact nearly indestructible. Is this laptop destructible? <laughs> Hell yes. It's just not very easy. And when it does get destroyed or broken, it can be easily used for parts, or it can be repaired. Because one of the provisions of the OLPC program is that they were training students, that's young children, on how to fix their own laptops using parts that were freely available to them. If they broke the screen, they would be trained on how to replace it. If the laptop took a bath, they could easily replace all the electronic components 
inside. And the purpose was to keep the shell or keep as many parts not only easy to replace, but to keep the entire machine alive as long as possible. It's just, it was such a an, an ambitious program, and it didn't go without criticism. I mean, I'm sure, you know, introducing children in third world nations who have otherwise relatively simple lives, you're introducing them not only to technology, but to the shortcomings of technology, the dependence on technology, and the reliability of electronics in addition to the reliability of um, the device itself and as far as random system hang-ups and crashes. So you're introducing them to part of first world life that we all would rather not have to deal with. You get my drift. In terms of horsepower, we're not dealing with a lot here. Now, the OLPC program was partially funded by major tech corporations, and their goal was to keep costs as low as humanly possible while making a device that is, in fact, functional. Now, you saw in my outdoor demonstration of the reflective display how long it took to start up. Well, it takes almost as long to launch applications because of all the shortcomings of the low-cost technology in uh, I'm going to go over with you the, the specs as found on the OLPC wiki page. The processor is an x86 compatible with 64 kilobytes of level 1 and, and, and I think it might be a typo. It says level 1 and D cache. 128k of level 2 cache. And it's an AMD Geode LX700 running at 433 megahertz. Now, already, we have a, a low power processor. It runs at 0.8 watts, which is crazy. Um, it does include support for MMX and 3D Now instruction sets. Um, and it contains an Athlon instruction set, including MMX and 3D Now Enhanced, with additional geode specific instructions. Companion chips, PCI and memory interface integrated with CPU. Northbridge, PCI and memory interface integrated with Geode CPU. AMD CS5536 Southbridge, hmm. integrated graphics. So it's basically a single chip board. <laughs> graphics, Southbridge, Northbridge, all in one chip. Um, let's see. Dynamic RAM, 256 megabytes, which isn't terrible, considering it's a, it's a low size or, or lightweight OS, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, it has one gigabyte of onboard mass storage, and it's in a SLC NAND flash chip. Um, it does have a built-in... Uh, I'll show you that right here. It has a built-in... SD card slot right there. So you can actually expand the onboard storage, which is nice. You can actually run an entire operating system off of that slot, um, making it a dual boot system. Yeah. I haven't done that yet, but I may experiment. But one of the things I really like about it is the fact that it's weather resistant. The membrane keyboard sucks. It's the worst keyboard I've ever used but it's also weather resistant and there's a compromise there. You can't have a full mechanical keyboard that is weather resistant, at least not at the price point they were looking at at the time. But one of the benefits of its rather long life design, think of this as the Grumman LLV of laptops. Google Grumman LLV and you'll see what I mean. US mail trucks. Um, it is designed to be repaired and used. Um, so in doing that, when they created modern or um, success, succeeding revisions of this laptop, they made sure that the parts used on the new laptop were backwards compatible with the original X01. So you can replace this membrane keyboard with the mechanical keyboard of its successor. It does feature a, a, um, a stylus trackpad here and here, but I have found no reference of it being used or even finding a stylus that it works on. 
So I'm not really sure if that was a feature that was added but never quite used. Um, but this is the normal touchpad right here, which is pretty responsive. As I demonstrated outside, the screen can be rotated for e-reader mode, um, for left or right-handed use. Um, it, it's pretty versatile in that sense. The camera built in is a 640 by 480 resolution camera, which I'll show you as well. Um, indicators are pretty pretty basic. You have your low battery or battery charge indicator. You've got your power indicator there. This is your SSD uh, access indicator and the wireless um, communications indicator. So if I launch the web browser, which is a very basic web browser, that little Wi-Fi indicator should start flashing. Low power and range of input power uh, was definitely a consideration. These devices were originally intended to be powered or charged by a hand crank device, but they determined that the hand crank device wasn't efficient enough, and um, they modified it to run on a solar panel system. I don't have the solar panel, and I don't think I can get it. I believe they were only, only made as many as they had to. Um, but the range and in input power is between 11 and 18 volts DC, whereas a modern laptop is about 19 volts, and it has to be 19 volts for it to work properly. Sadly, the battery um, lifespan isn't what you would think. It's about three hours. Um, and they used Life PO4 technology. That's the type of cells that they used. 22.8 watt life PO4. This is this is what I'm seeing here. That's lithium ion something something. I don't know. And I believe there was also a nickel metal hydride option as well. I believe this laptop has the nickel metal hydride battery in it. Um, now those batteries they are no longer in production and they they're. Um, all of the batteries that were made were shipped overseas. Remember, the laptop was never officially sold in the U.S. It was never intended to be sold in the U.S. Um, it was primarily to be exported or, well, it was never made here either, but <laughs> primarily to be used in developing nations. So there isn't like a Batteries Plus part number for it. I believe only about 15,000 of these things are in the U.S or wherever in the U.S. to begin with. Um, remember, only 78,000 devices uh, were purchased under the buy one, get one program. So there are no batteries in the U.S. for this device. And when the battery goes, it goes. That's pretty much it. So I might consider um, looking into rebuilding the pack, finding out if I can buy the cells, and simply rebuilding it. Um, that might be the most logical choice. The battery is good for about two and a half to three hours anyway, so I'm not really concerned. And not only that, but I'm not going to use this device um, for anything real anyway. I only bought it out of curiosity's sake. One of the surprising things about this laptop is simply how heavy it is. Uh, because it was made with low-cost technology, um, weight was not really one of the primary concerns. Uh, remember, the, the lightest and more power-friendly uh, components are often the most expensive. You know, so it has an older LCD technology, and those, that, that display is quite heavy. Um, but there's a lot of heft to it, um, more than you would think, anyway. So what it looks like from the bottom. I love the textured finish. It's designed so that you won't, it won't slip out of your hand. It's pretty cool. All right, where were we? Browser. Yes. I'm going to try to do some light web browsing. Let's go to uh, slash dot dot org. I wonder if it'll load. The problem with these lightweight browsers is that they don't often support Flash and Java. You know, there are no browser plugins that can be downloaded for it. But Slashdot might actually load. Let's see. 
I believe it was on Slashdot that I learned about the OLPC, actually, in general. Um, yeah. One of the fun facts that I found is that the, the, the buttons, the X, the O, the little box, they were inspired by the Sony PlayStation remote, which is kind of funny. Speaking of PlayStation, um, there are a lot of games that were made for the XO that are educationally oriented. I kind of wonder if there's anything like Oregon Trail for the XO. That'd be kind of fun. Um, to go backpacking or something with this device and then play Oregon Trail. <laughs> but we're still loading. Um, it hasn't really gone anywhere. Um, interesting. You know, as limited as this device is, I still think it's one of the coolest laptops ever made for a couple of reasons. It was a historical project, unprecedented. It was the first of the XO, or the One Laptop Per Child uh, program, which is now, by the way, uh, offering a tablet rather than a laptop. They don't make laptops anymore. Um, they're encouraging the use of tablets. And uh, I heard somewhere that there's an OLPC brand tablet you can buy at Walmart, which kind of waters down the whole program, but it does put technology into the hands of disadvantaged children, um, many of which shop at Walmart, apparently. Um, but I believe that as far as I know, the, the OLPC laptop, or the, um, the XO, I'm sorry, tablet, uh, features a lot of the same educational-oriented programs that the XO had. XO1. I'm still getting nowhere. This sucks. All right, so Internet sucks on this thing. Um, it does turn back Google results, which is nice. Like if I search for cookies, let's see what that does. Yeah, it's, it's just... It's, it's not viable on the Internet. And it's sad because the internet has devolved into a platform for serving up advertisements and porn, which is kind of what its original intention was. But it makes using devices like this kind of impossible. Um, web pages are now loaded with so much flash animation and so much JavaScript, HTML5 script, etc. It, it's just, it, it doesn't work well with older browsers. Even though I'm running, the, I think, one of the latest OS's it can run. So let's talk a little bit about that. Now using this OS, which is called Sugar, is a bit tricky because it doesn't work like a modern OS. The interface is a little different. Um, your task manager, for example, is accessible by moving the, the mouse cursor to the top left-hand corner of the display and it shows you a couple of different things. These are applications that you're running um, and these three but these four buttons are the same function as these four buttons. Um, so if I click on the one on the very far left, this is my neighborhood icon or, or um, menu. The neighborhood menu is one of the hallmarks of the, uh, the XO. It shows me where I am, I'm in the middle here, and it shows me where roughly all of my network access points are located. I believe it uses some form of triangulation to determine where they are in relation to where I'm sitting, um, which is totally bogus, but it shows me all of my neighbors' access points in addition to mesh networks that were designed for use with the XO if they're enabled. Um, so if I'm in Africa, and there are a couple of mesh networks or access points located in my area, I can connect directly to them from here. Um, as of right now, I'm connected to my, cell, my own wireless network, which shows up over here. There I am, BishopNet. And it shows this mesh network, which I, I'm not really sure where it's getting that. I don't know what that actually is, but I know it's not an XO mesh network access point. Um, I still have more research to do on that. The second button in shows me my login screen, if you will, and I can right click on myself. Maybe not here.
again. I still have a lot of research to do, but that basically brings me to my what I perceive to be a login page. Third button in shows me my application in wheel form. I can change that to list form, which actually shows me the, the application icon plus the name and uh, what version it is and uh, how old it is. If I click on my icon here, right click on it, it brings up the control panel, restart, shutdown, and my register icon. Control panel is very simplified. Um, it has an about me icon which gives me my name and I can change the color of my um, I can change the color of myself. So if I'm in a mesh network, everybody's color shows up by their icon so that way I can so if I know you know little Johnny is uh, orange with red outlining I'll, I'll see him right there without seeing his name. It's pretty cool. About my XO gives me information on my laptop. Serial number, OS build version, firmware build. Um, I'm running QF, Q2F20. The operating system build 767 of Sugar. Um, plus copyright and license information. I can set date and time from here, which is currently inaccurate. I need to change that. And then UTC plus 5. Or am I in negative five? I think I'm in negative five. Yeah. There we go. I'll restart later. The frame icon, this is where I learned to, by the way, it's called this right here. Let's see if it shows up. No. But that outer frame that has all my laptop status, uh, um, let's call it the task manager, it's called frame. And I can change the uh, the hot the hot corner to have a one second delay or to delay immediately or to launch it immediately. Language should be English USA. Okay, good. Network. This is really basic too. It lets me turn the radio on or off. That's it. And also discard. Um, network history, which consists of networks I've connected to. Power options. I can change the power management to automatic or extreme. Extreme disables the wireless radio automatically. So if I'm in the middle of the boonies and there's no access point nearby and I'm doing research or whatever, not research, but if I'm, I'm, if I'm inputting data to it, then I would want that. Software update I've already run but it's going to do a quick search for updates. One of the things I need to do to this one is a firmware update. I've already updated the OS, which is done uh, by copying the image file to a flash drive and then booting off of a, um, not booting off the flash drive, but booting into a firmware update mode. Oh, apparently there's more updates. Oh, nice. Once you do that, it will actually um, erase the onboard storage, reinstall the OS to whatever version is on the flash drive, and there you go. And that's how you bring it back to factory defaults, or update the OS, or downgrade the OS. You can, you can actually downgrade it too. But one of the other features is you can upgrade the firmware that way, and I need to do that because this has an older firmware that keeps crashing, um, I'm having the infamous keyboard lockup issue where it won't respond to keyboard input. And um, I was uh, informed through research that that can be fixed with a firmware update. But I wanted to show you guys an XO1, and I've done so. I'm going to uh, now show you the camera and the video recording features that it has, and we're going we're gonna to play with that for a little bit once this update finishes. Here's a chart found on the wikilaptop.org website um, that actually shows you what the latest firmware versions are for you know the Exo series. And if you have an Exo one, 
Q2F2O is the latest version, and I'm already running it. So I guess it's just a buggy piece of hardware. Um, and there you have it. So let's go ahead and do a quick video test. I'm going to launch the... Um, uh, where is it? There's an application that uses the camera called Record. There it is. Did I mention it was slow? I apologize if I didn't. And there I am. Okay, so let's do a quick record session here. Switch to video mode. And hit record. Okay, we have a two minute recording time frame and I am not getting anywhere with this. Oh, there we go. Okay, it's kind of jerky. Well, I was going to try to do a video on this sucker, but it just isn't cooperating. It's too slow. Um, <laughs> I mean, really. It, it just doesn't want to happen. Um, so we're just going to not do that, I guess. Um, I did make a quick clip, but I tried to delete it, and it didn't. It's just being a jerk. So, um, It does do video, though. It's just not usable for that. So, yeah. All right, we're going to just stop that. Okay, oh, slash dot finally loaded. It took an hour, but it loaded. Yeah. <laughs> All right. You know, it, it's just sad because a device like this, I mean, as well made as it really is and how durable and you know I, I just kind of a, a shame that it it just can't keep up with the modern world if it had more memory and maybe a little bit more internal storage it would be a real contender but um i'm just gonna have to say it isn't i'm probably gonna stick this in a display cabinet at work and leave it there and that's probably where it's gonna spend the rest of its life um you know and just but I encourage you guys to go on the OLPC wiki page to learn more about it and what's on it for software. I can't really demonstrate it all because I don't have that kind of time. Because um, it's too slow. If you want to get one yourself, these usually pop up on eBay. And they've been coming up frequently um, for somewhere in the $50 range uh, with a power supply. And that's all they came with, the power supply and the laptop. Um, and that's all you need. So... I'm going to look at shutting it down here, see if I can uh, do that. I'll just switch it to the favorites view, which reminds me of a phone dial. And I'm going to shut it down. And there she goes. The cool thing about this, though, is you can change the OS. Um, there are people that have figured out a way to run some version of, uh, I think it was either Ubuntu. Yeah, I think someone figured out a way to run Ubuntu on it. Um, another possibility is, um, uh, what's that other one? Poppy Linux. And, oops, that's a little tight. Uh, Poppy Linux will run on this, and I believe... 
some enterprising entrepreneur has managed to run Windows on it as well. But I don't see what the benefit of putting Windows on it would be. Because you wouldn't really get much of a, an improvement in performance. If anything, it would be worse. But we're talking Windows 95 here. Or what, Windows XP, I believe. I'd like to figure out a way to run Windows 3.1 on it. I think that could be fun. <laughs> It'll run really well. Um, actually, technically, I, I bet it would run Windows 3.1. I bet it would do it. Maybe. Maybe not. Well, on that note, I'm going to uh, let you guys go. Thanks for